I want you, while you're standing, to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Um, you know, I'm convinced, and you may think I'm strange before I'm done with this message. I'm sure you've thought that already, but I'm just... But, but I, I'm convinced that most big ideas are defeated in your own mind. I'm talking about God ideas, not, your, not just your personal conjured up ideas. I'm talking about God ideas. I really believe that most big ideas are defeated in your mind. And there's a very common story in the Bible involving a teenage boy who slays a giant and saves a nation. Something most overlooked in this story is the way that God partners with this boy's mind. And before weapons are even used, David has Goliath defeated before weapons are even used. A boy. You see, David had a big idea, but the possibility of the big idea ever becoming a reality required a mind free to think big. I know some of you are gonna say, oh, pastor, you're on some of this weird, uh, new agey kind of positive thinking. No, 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 you know what? I just believe all things are possible with God. And I just believe that God thinks big ideas and good ideas about us. And sometimes we are our worst enemies. And that he wants us indeed to think big, pray big, have big faith, believe big. Understand that God does big things. If you don't believe that, open your eyes. You are a participant of big things happening all around you today. I told you a few weeks ago, you're holding, you're holding the world in your hand with a smartphone. Now, 20 years ago, if you would have said that that was going to happen, we would have thought somebody needed to go to the loony farm. Not, not Phil's farm, but I'm talking about a, a nut farm. <laughs> well, I guess he'd fit there too, but anyway. That's exactly why, listen to me, that's exactly why you and I need our minds unstuck. Unstuck. The word unstuck is an adjective which means freed or loosened from being fastened or stuck. Speaking of stuck, let's read this scripture and then we'll move forward. Uh, the Philistines are at war here with Israel. They're paralyzed with fear due to a warrior named Goliath. He's referred to as a Philistine giant, believed to be over nine feet tall. You know the story. He was a skilled fighting machine. Even David's brothers are hiding in the bunker. They're closed, cl closed up and scared. And the teenage boy in this story is David, believed to be 16, 17, 18 years of age at this time. And while his brothers were supposedly fighting, Jesse, his father, knows that the guys are hungry and they need food. And so David the young boy goes into the front lines and takes him a meal. And what does David encounter? A giant, threatening, scoffing, taunting, challenging, and bullying the whole army, which leads us to this passage. Verse 32 through 37, 1 Samuel 17. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, this boy, will go fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. You're a youth. He's a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. He already saw it in the mind. He'll be just like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. And moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. Dropping down to verse 47, 51, then all this assembly 
shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the? The battle is the? Come on, shout it out. The battle is the? And he will give you into our hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. And David, I love this. And David hurried and ran toward, (laughs) ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He didn't walk. He ran toward him. And David put his hand in the bag and took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, fell on the face to the earth. So David prevailed and killed him. There was no sword in his hand. You know the rest of the story. It's pretty gruesome. That big mouth lost his head. (sighs) Lost his head. We serve a big God who is capable of doing big things and bringing forth his big ideas. And don't you ever doubt it. Because when you doubt it, you're doubting the word of the Lord and you're doubting the Lord himself. So Father, help us. Help us to believe. Help us to know that it ain't over yet. Lord, if there's one here that's having a hard time grasping that, fill them with faith and hope in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. Don't judge me on this joke. Um, Somebody else sent me one. They want to remain anonymous. Speaking of stuck, a man is stuck inside a public restroom without any toilet paper. That's as bad as it gets. He calls over to the man in the next stall. Hey, do you have any extra toilet paper in there? No, replies the man. You got any newspaper over there? The stranded man asks. Nope, the second man replies. After a long moment of silence, the first man asks the second, you got two fives for a 10? (laughs) Moving right along, uh, when we get stuck, it doesn't hurt to get creative, right? Okay. Steve's saying, I can't believe you said that, Pastor, but I couldn't resist it. Stuck. It's the best thing I could find. I'm stuck. But anyway, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we find a nation stuck. A king named Saul is stuck. Brothers of a boy named David are stuck. Fear has paralyzed the whole army. We just glanced at the story. But what David did was teach us how to use four things. I want you to get this. Four simple things in order to win any battle and how to avoid getting stuck. How many want to get unstuck and you want to believe God for big things in your life? Is there anybody here? Well, this first one is pretty simple. Use your motivation. Find your motivation. And beside that, I would put in parentheses, my motivation is the Lord. Verses 47 through 51 says that all of this assembly shall know that the Lord (laughs) does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord. You see, we make a big mistake when we think this battle was all about David and his skilled weaponry and all that he had learned and all of that. Now, that's a part of what David leans on, but David understands clearly that the battle is the Lord's, and without the Lord, I will not win this battle. Without the Lord, I may not get that next job. Without the Lord, I may not receive that healing. Without the Lord, my marriage is hopeless. Without the Lord, my bank account is in big trouble. Without the Lord, I may not finish this project. What I'm trying to tell you is the battle is the Lord's. And the Lord is the motivation. And why is the Lord the motivation? Because he wants, according to this scripture and many others we could call up, the Lord wants everyone to know that he is big, that he is great, and he does mighty things for you and I. He wants to prove his existence. For David, Philippians 4.13 was a reality. 
I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ, not with my spear, not with my, not with my sword, not with the stones, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's why John said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's why the Apostle Paul said that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Can we give the Lord big praise that he is all of that? He is our motivation, and he's why we conquer. You see, this motivation leads David to do this. He has to size up the problem. He sized up the problem. Now, when you size up the problem, I'm sure it had to look pretty big. A nine-feet giant, a skilled warrior. When David sized up the problem, it paled, though, in comparison to the solution. And that's what God is wanting you and I to do. When you size up your battle this morning, when you size up what it is that you're coming against, when you size up the circumstances that are against you, when you size up your situation, will you just know, please just know, that the solution is bigger than what you size up? You didn't get that. The solution, God is the solution, and he is bigger than any giant in your life. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how impossible it looks. I don't care what, how you describe it. Our God is bigger than anything you're sizing up in your life. Now, let's give him one more praise that he is worthy of. Love. The giant to others looked to be a big problem, such a big problem that they went and hid. The giant to others was a big problem. So big, it had them paralyzed. Who was the cause of their paralysis? The common eye would look at it and say, Goliath is causing fear. The bully is causing fear. The problem wasn't the bully. He wanted you to think he was the problem. The problem wasn't the bully. The problem was what you're allowing the bully to do in your life. The problem is what you're allowing it to do to you. So when we ultimately are honest with ourselves, they're not the problem, we're the problem. Somebody's got to stand up on the inside and realize my God is bigger than the bully. My God is bigger than his threats. My God is bigger than what he is telling me. My God is bigger than all of this. So sometimes the problem is not the bully. The problem is what we think about the bully and how small we think God is. Am I, am I making any sense? Um, in comparison, there is no comparison. This so-called big problem called Goliath is minuscule to God's, to what David's big God. Did you get that? This, this big mouth threatening agent who, who thought he was somebody, who thought nobody could defeat him. Yes, I'm saying it. I'm saying it with some moxie. This big mouth who thought he was everything was minuscule compared to David's big God and my big God who happens to be the same big God. Isn't he great? Watch this. The second part of your motivation is to seize the opportunity. Seize the opportunity. Uh, watch this. I've said this before in years gone past in a series we were involved with. Every crisis is God's opportunity to show up big. Most of us don't think about that. Take take note of verse 46 again. It says, so the whole world will know. God wants to show off big, not just so you get your agenda met. That's good. But so that the whole world will know so that all of your friends will know, so your neighbors will know, so everybody that's involved with you will know, so the doctor will know. What about that? So everybody will know that God is a big God. So opportunity to defeat a giant in your life should be motivation to advance. Every crisis is an opportunity to, <laughs> to advance. You know, you know the, difference between, uh, the difference between the guy who, who wants the ball at the end of the game and the guy who doesn't, It's simply one guy is thinking that I can do this through Christ, or I can do this because I have the skill set, or even, let's let's even be more plain. I have an opportunity to win this game. The guy who doesn't want the ball is thinking more about being a failure than a victor. 
The guy who doesn't want the ball on the free, line, free throw line with one second left, and, and you're two points down, excuse me, one point down, he got two free throws. He's shaking and he's nervous inside, and he feels all weak because he's afraid of being a goat. But the guy that wants the ball, that's, you know, Michael, Jock, Jack, Jack, uh, Jack, uh, Michael, you know him, Michael Jordan. I got Michael Jackson on my mind. Wendy won't let me forget that, I'll just tell you. Michael Jackson's on my mind, I don't know why. Michael Jordan, he wanted the ball. He wanted the ball on the line, why? Because we all knew that he believed that he was gonna hit the winning shot. He didn't just hit one winning shot, he hit winning shot after winning shot after winning shot. He demanded the ball when the game was on the line. Is that what you're made of? Are you made up of that? Or are you one of those that wants to go crawl up in the shadow and say, let somebody else carry it because I don't want to be the bad guy. You know what God wants us to do? We need to see these kinds of things as opportunities. Opportunities to win. Opportunities for God to show up big in our lives. Opportunities for God to show up big in our church. Opportunities for God to show up big in our witness. That's what we need to be about. Now, can we give the Lord praise for all of that? He's a good God. Every crisis is an opportunity for God to show up big. Um, that series I was talking about was the great exodus. I mean, you can go back to Moses. It's all through the Bible. You know, can you hear the people? How will we know where to go? Well, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He's our guide. Well, how will we fight? They get to the Red Sea. How are we going to fight? We can't fight. Uh, well, um, he's our deliverer. He rolls back the, <laughs> the Red Sea so we can walk away. The battle is his. Well, well, well what will we eat? Well, he's going to send quail from heaven. He's our manna. He's not just our deliverer. He's not just our guide, but he, he's our manna. Well, well who, who will be our doctor? Well, they hit bitter water three days into the journey after they cross the Red Sea, and they get sick, and the Lord heals them all. So, so we don't know who the doctor is going to be, but he's our healer. He's our great physician. Um, he's a lawgiver. He's, he's a peacemaker. He's a reconciler. You can follow him for 40 years as he leads them through that exodus an event and crisis after crisis after crisis. God keeps revealing how big he is and he wants to do the same thing in your life and my life. Crisis should always become an opportunity for God to show off big. The second thing David taught us is when it came to getting unstuck, uh, use your memory. Um, <laughs> this is important. If you don't get anything else, get this. Verses 32 through 37, Saul said to David, um, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you're just a youth. Uh, he's a, a big man. Um, he's a man of war from his youth. He's highly skilled. But David said to Saul, your servant <laughs> uh, used to keep the sheep. I, I might only be 15, 16, 17, whatever he was, but I used to keep the sheep. And a bear showed up. And he told him about a bear and a lion that sought to kill his father's sheep. He took a hold of the bear and destroyed it. Can you imagine? God was showing up big in this child's life. All right, Americans. My baby can't get married till they're 40. I don't know that they're equipped. Parents, you're a problem. <laughs> My baby can't handle this, can't handle that. Will you knock it off? You might be surprised what God can do through your child, how God can answer their prayers, how God can move mountains through their faith, and how God can begin to develop them. If you just take your hands off them and kept, let, kept keeping them from every experience, every time they fall, you're running around trying to hold them up. Every time they fall off the bike, you're wanting to throw the bike away and get them a three-wheeler. Am I okay? You're not allowing God to show up big in their life through experience. I need some help right here. Grandparents, parents, please. I'm telling you the truth. I am absolutely telling you the truth. God can show up big 
in our children's lives. And he wants to establish memory in them, faith stories in them, faith stories like he did me when I was nine years old and I watched a crippled, I'm serious, I'll go to my grave believing it, I don't care what you think, I watched as a nine-year-old my neighbor get up out of a wheelchair, I knew my neighbor, there was no game playing in this, and carry his wheelchair out the back door. I watched that. My dad, we used to go over and help him, rake his leaves and help him out because my dad was concerned about this paralytic. Walt Thumser was his name. And that next week when he walked into the post office, people began to say, wow. And the next week the church was filled with people. Now you can believe what you want to believe like that and you can say this was a hoax and I know that's a hoax and I heard this story about Benny Hinn and I heard this story about that. I don't give a rip what you think. I'm telling you God is a miracle working God and I will never forget what God did for me. So you can put your cynicism away. I know what I experienced. I know what I saw firsthand. Now, if you want to check out my credibility on that, you just go up to White Cloud, Michigan and start talking to a few of the old timers. We watched that. Ultimately, a few years later, they had to build a new church. They had to build a new church because God worked through signs and wonders. What are you saying, Pastor Kelvin? I'm saying he can use your memory. That began to prove some things to me. And the things that God has done in my life have been proven because when I look back to God's faithfulness, it's a wonderful thing to see what God has done. Your mind has two purposes. It's designed to two things, uh, to remember God moments. You see, the past should be a memorial or a marker, not an anchor. Pastor Jared said that this week in Creative Preaching. I loved it. He said, your mind has two purposes. We talked about that. But the past, he said, should be a memorial or a marker, not an anchor. Boy, that's good. That is good stuff. So you see, the past should be this, not be a memorial or, or be a memorial and a marker to build our faith. So what do we do? We recall his faithfulness. All through his word, there are these unstuck moments. We've already talked about Moses. Abraham had to leave his home. Disciples had to leave their nets to follow Jesus. Paul, on the road to Damascus, had to have a faith encounter, an experience to to lean on for the rest of his life. David punched his memory when facing Goliath. Memory that said, you as a kid took down a bear and you took down a lion. Who is this guy standing up here making threats to my people? You've taken down a bear. You've taken down a lion. You can take that big man down and you can drop him for the glory of God. Let's all give him praise. That's okay. Come on. Let's all give him praise. He's worthy of that praise. You got memories? I don't want to bore you with my story. I think of a kid being very foolish. I'm not going to unpack those story. Tra- traveling in, in a Chevelle, 1972 Chevelle Super Sport, 396, with a pedal all the way in the carburetor, trying to beat curfew because I was scared of my little five foot mother. And facing death by that much. I look back at that. I remember stopping. It was like I heard the voice of the Lord. I got a purpose for you, boy. I have those kind of stories. Struggling through my faith. Faith crisis. Is God real? Is God real? Laying in the bed late at night. As a young teenager, are you real? Being exposed to some other religions, which one's right? Having to work through all of that and then having God keep showing up to prove to me that he's a reality. Anybody else with me? Memories, memories. Um, There are good memories and there are bad memories. Memories are either a foundation for holy imagination or for destruction of your holy assignment. You didn't get that. Let me say it again. There are good memories and there are bad memories. Memories are either a foundation for a holy imagination or destruction for your holy assignment. Listen to me. 
Memory is the foundation for your holy imagination. You need to write that down. Memory is the foundation for your holy imagination. Good memory drives out fear when you have a holy imagination. Um, that's why ha, we can celebrate God's goodness to Zach Gates, who's sitting here, and he told me a few weeks ago about a stroke he had, and it makes no sense that it didn't have any effect. That's why Vince is on a different journey, but he's sitting here today because of a miraculous God instead of doing one big miracle, is doing a series of many and many miracles in his life. God, God does different things in all of our lives as we journey. The important thing is that we see God in it and that he's creating a foundation of memories for us so that when we have a holy imagination, we don't have to have fear. When Westmore has a holy, holy imagination to do what we've done out in the property, we don't have to have fear because we've got memories that God has been faithful. When we go out on a limb with a business deal, we don't have to fear because God has been faithful to us in the past. When we go out on a limb and make a big decision, knowing somehow that God is gonna help us, that because he's been faithful in the past, he's gonna see us through with our holy imagination. When I look at projects around this city, and I don't wanna just drop this, I'm very serious about it, I know what Kyle's working through, and that's a big deal. The school system, that is a big deal, this Pi Center. But the same God that has brought leaders through before is the same God that'll bring that project through for the glory of God. And it's not about him or it's not about a school system, it's about the job young people will be able to have and sit down at a table with their wife someday or their husband someday and be able to put food on the table and a roof over their head because somebody has sacrificed and paid a price. You see, we can have a holy imagination. I said we can have a holy imagination because there's a big God who has provided memories. And as we recall those big things, God is going to take us through the big things in the future. Ah, can we give him praise for that? Memory is the gate to imagination. Vision is seeing something that could be and should be and ultimately, ultimately we get to will be because God has been faithful in the past. <laughs> Memory and imagination are designed to converge, not separate. This moment you exist in is not separated from yesterday, for he is the same yesterday and has proven who he is yesterday. And that same God that was there yesterday will be there today. And the same God that was there yesterday and is here today will be there tomorrow because Hebrews 13, 8 says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Forever. So, memory and imagination converge and God gives you memories to fill you with faith to have holy imaginations am I making any sense um, the third thing David taught us when it comes to getting unstuck was use your mind we've been on this to imagine victory David's memory of a bear falling and a lion falling opened a confident imagination for victory in his mind he saw the giant falling, which led to an implementation of strategy. Watch this. <laughs> Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was roused against David. Can you imagine? Old brother Eliab thought David was being cocky. Some of you get mad at somebody who's got faith in Christ, and you think they're cocky and arrogant. They're not cocky and arrogant. They just know God's going to see them through. No, don't misjudge confidence for cockiness. You'll hinder leadership. Am I making any sense? Confidence doesn't mean you're cocky. And old brother Eliab, he, he's heard enough of this. You know why? Because it's exposing his complacency. Um, it says his anger is aroused against David. So now he doesn't only have Goliath, he's got this big mouth brother who's complacent and thinks little brother showing him up. Now, he's not saying that. He's trying to put him down under his thumb. Uh, why did you come down here, he asked. 
You can read it. And with whom have you left those few sheep and get back to cut, get back to taking care of the sheep, little brother? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down just to see the battle. He, he's full of, in, he's indignant. He's angry because little brother has showed up. Drop the food off and get out of here. And he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. So now he's got a crowd against him. They're almost jabbing him and making fun of him. Um, now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said, I don't have anything to lose. He's pretty confident. Let's give him a shot. And David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And he talked about the bear and the lion. You're all doubting me. Just give me a shot. Give me a shot. Is that cocky? I don't read cockiness there. I read somebody that is very confident because God has showed up in his past. Listen to me, Westmore. He believed his imagination was there. In fact, a king is in development. A young boy is going to be a future king, has a big idea. He didn't know the time, but if it had not been for this experience, this young boy would have never had the way paved to become king over Israel. You see, God had many more big opportunities. This was just one. Because once you learn to succeed through one big opportunity, you're not afraid to take on another big opportunity. That's why a lot of businessmen make it, because they're not afraid to take on the next big opportunity. Am I making any sense here this morning? That's why a lot of people make it through, through their imaginations and visions, because they're not afraid. They're going to figure out how to do it, and they're going to be tenacious at it, and they're going to say, hey, the same God that brought me through this path in the past is the same God that will help me in the future. Can we give the Lord big praise that he does all of that? Come on, come on. Come on. He's worthy of our praise. You know, don't you love this? Oh, Saul. Saul starts trying to strategize for the boy. Um, hey, come and take my equipment. <laughs> take. Saul was a warrior too. Now, he wasn't too quick to get out here and battle with Goliath. <laughs> so, take my stuff. Take, take my spear, take my garments, take my shield, take my outfit. And the equipment was cumbersome because it was Saul's strategy. Some of us older people need to get out of the way and let some of these young people get some strategies from God. If we're going to be an intergenerational church, we've got to do a little bit of that. Well, we've got to get them up to the table when we're talking business. Boy, it's quiet. Uh, yeah. We got to get them up to the table when it comes to praying for the sick. We got to get them up to the table when it comes to singing like we did this morning, like we do almost every Sunday. We, we got to get them up to the table in leadership. Now, they're not going to have everything to say, and neither are you. But all together as we counsel one another and the generations counsel together, you know what? I believe we can find the wisdom of God. Am I Okay. We got to figure out how to empower, but but but, but nonetheless, um, King Saul had his way of going about this, and so he 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 starts strategizing and, and lets him know that you're going to wear this equipment. No, no, I don't want to dwell on this, but I'm going to say this because some of you perhaps are in ministry, been in ministry, have family in ministry. I, I don't know all of your situations, but I've watched this in ministry for years. Some things we take into churches don't fit. It doesn't fit. We're being told by all the trend makers that this is the way you're supposed to do it. Five years up the road, the trends change. Am I okay? I, I hear that all the time. I've heard that since I started in ministry. Everybody's supposed to be the trend maker. They write books about it. Half of it takes place and half of it doesn't. Everybody's got a new trend, a new way of doing it. And you know what? There's a new way of doing it, and sometimes those trends are good. But sometimes we take this trend because it works over there, and we try to make it work over here, and it doesn't work. And next thing you know, we're getting defeated rather than overcoming. Am I making any sense? When you try to take somebody else's model, somebody else's equipment, somebody else's stuff, somebody else's idea, and we just take it and we embrace it all 100% because it worked way over here. It may not work here. 
I'm tired of going to church growth conferences and hearing that stuff all the time. Some things don't work everywhere. Am I making any sense? That's why we, we use language like we got to customize ministry to fit our church. Not every church has our stories. Not every church has our DNA. Not every church has our way of doing it. We're not going to put on somebody else's equipment. What we want to put on is the equipment that the Holy Spirit empowers us with and what he tells us to do. And when he says go left, we need to go left. And when he says go right, we need to go right. And we need to follow him and pay attention to what God is doing in our family. Can we give the Lord praise for that? The equipment was cumbersome. So David says, let me use my tools. I was bored out, bored to death out there in the field watching those sheep. So I had this little slingshot and I'd knock a hole in the tree. Takes a, <laughs> a slingshot. I wish I'd have brought one of those that looked, I had one at one time. I don't know where it's at. It's probably packed away somewhere. One of those original looking slingshot. I probably wouldn't need to shoot it. it would, Lord knows where it'd go, but anyway. Five stones, and only took one. Used his personal tools, comfortable tools. <laughs> and God's anointing got on that rock. The same guy that guided the children of Israel for 40 years with a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, the same God that got on top of that rock. And he guided it. I said, God guided that rock. And he had all this equipment on. And I found one little open area. He didn't have enough equipment on. Boom, sunk that head in. You say, you're sounding excited. Go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I wouldn't have been standing there going, oh, poor Goliath. Mercy, mercy. Goliath dropped, and that was the end of that. Um, let's wrap this up. The fourth and final unstuck principle is use your moxie. Some of you are afraid of moxie. It's not politically correct. Everybody's afraid of moxie. Um, when you're trying to get unstuck, there's going to be naysayers. As we said, your courage exposes their complacency. Um, David huh, knocks him down. Puts his foot on the chest, pulls his sword out because he didn't have one, and takes his sword and cuts his head off. Now, that wouldn't go so well with some of you either. There was no sword in the hand of David. Runs and he stands over the Philistine. So it took some moxie. It took this moxie marrying with God's power. God raises up leaders at times to do difficult, challenging things. He does it in your school. He does it in the police force. Mike has had to have moxie when he walks up beside somebody threatening him. He better have a little bit of moxie. Hugging's not going to get it done. It's good to try it, but there'll come a time when the hugging don't work. There's time when Kyle has to deal with a student at school and hugging's not going to work. It takes some moxie. Our security team in this church, if ever a situation arises, better have the moxie or they don't need to be on the security team. Am I making any sense? Pastor, I can't believe you're talking this way. Oh, yeah. Moxie. Um, this moxie led David to be courageous. I don't know who told you you weren't going to make it. Who told you you weren't going to make it? You need a little moxie to say, you're not God. You're not God. What do you mean I'm not going to make it? If God's for me, who can be against me? God has moxie. God put some moxie in some of you men. Now, we don't want to create monsters and unbridled anger. Nobody's for that. We don't want to create wife beaters, if you're that kind of person, we need to beat you up. We don't want any of that. But there's a time to have some moxie. God built that in a man. Women, let your man have a little bit of that. Quit trying to knock it out of him or threaten it out of him. 
Moxie's not all bad. Good Lord, when we're getting protected by our police force, I want them to have some moxie. They got to run in. I want our firemen to have some moxie. I want our military to have some moxie. I want men of God to have some moxie when the devil shows up at the door and says, I'm going to do this and that to your family. I want some moxie. You need some moxie. We all need moxie. Let's give the Lord praise for moxie. So to be courageous, that same spirit that comes on an underdog that says, while others are saying, go home, no way, the underdog is saying, why not? Once again, that's the difference between the guy that's willing to take the winning shot. And even if he misses five times, he's still willing to keep taking it because one of those times he's going to hit it. And when he does, we're winners. Here's the bottom line. Be willing to do today what no, else, no one else is willing to do. Then you can live like no one else tomorrow. Be willing to do today what no one else is willing, then you can live like no one else tomorrow. Some of you are not willing to do anything that somebody else is not willing to do. But the Lord can help you because he's got tomorrow in mind and there's a Christ, crisis to solve. That's the last principle under Moxie. Be courageous, be courageous to solve the crisis. One will never solve their crisis if they don't find moxie to face it. Don't run. Don't run and hide if things have gotten bad. You'll never find your moxie, but rather call on your memory. They'll never find their moxie if they don't call on their memory that says God has been faithful. And they'll never have an imagination or what could be if they don't call on the memory of what God has been. We need imagination. We need big ideas. We need big ideas at Westmore. We need our young people to have big ideas. We need, we need inventors. God forbid that they'd all become preachers. We need some of them to become inventors. Oh, we might need a few preachers too. We need doctors and lawyers. We need teachers who figure out how to teach it just a little bit different where they get it. We need big ideas. And then we need seniors to walk in with their stories and say, you can do it because God has been faithful to me. Let me tell you how faithful God has been. And when we converge those stories with holy imagination, wow. Big things. I said big things. Great big things can happen because of a great big God. Would you stand with me? You know, here's the question. What stands in your way? What stands in your way of God's big ideas becoming reality in your life? Is there a lack of memory? Maybe you think you're the reason everything good's happened in your life. <laughs> Is there a lack of memory? With no memory, there's no holy imagination. What is it? Perhaps fear has led to paralysis like those young brothers. Those young brothers who had indignation against, those older brothers, I should say, who had indignation against David because he showed up and wanted to do something about it. Everybody won't go with you on that courageous battle, but one day, once you conquer it, they'll all be chasing you. That's the way people are. What is it? Is it your unwillingness to step out of the old armor and into a simpler way, like five stones and a sling? Maybe you got God in a box. It's all supposed to happen this way. So don't, think, don't you think it's time that you sized up your situation and let God fill you with holy imagination again. Holy imagination. He wants to do that.